The more chaos in the world, the more opportunity there is. Yeah, you made <laughs> Well, before okay. you start, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Thanks, Sobs, the support people, everybody with um, Nick's company. I really appreciate the support, and you, and you guys have had me, and the ride, the journey that we've made in the last almost three, actually three years now. And I look forward to many more successful years ahead, and hopefully many more of these uh, meet and greets. Yeah. Maybe we can do it in London or in another city or maybe Sydney. Yeah. Wherever, you tell me wherever it's going to be when I'll, I'll be there. Sydney sounds good. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to go to Sydney. I haven't been there in 10 years. I want to yeah, go. Manchester, Jeff. Manchester. UK. Manchester, no problem. Yeah, I like UK. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So it was a good trade today, NFB. <laughs> yeah, thank you. How'd you feel? I felt good. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I was tired. <laughs> Don't ask. Tell, I, me, tell me about what happened this morning. Well, I'll tell you. I woke up. I got here at 1 in the morning. And then, you know, because the time difference, I was messed up. Yeah. I slept about 2 to 3 hours because I knew I had to be at in front of the computer for NFP, so got up for NFP, drank 10 coffees, <laughs> waited for the news. I had a feeling it was gonna be a beat because just the numbers that have come in with the um, employment numbers lately, the employment, cl the uh, claims, I had a feeling that the market was a little low on their estimate on the NFP, so I was actually expecting a beat. Mm -hmm. So it actually worked out the exact way I wanted it to. Yeah. I closed the trade, I got out of that trade flat. I'm sure everyone here is happy. Yeah. I don't know, every, there was a little bit of heat over that trade. People were freaking out like, uh, you know, like the, their accounts are going to blow or something over 1%. But <laughs> it's like, honestly, yeah. I knew that even if it was a bad NFP, I would have got out of that trade yeah. one way or the other. So closed the trade, did one quick trade before it closed. I got a quick scalp and I was so tired I couldn't trade anymore. So you sitting there with the news in your earpiece, yes. your iPad? Yes. Yeah. I had a little miniature trading desk set up in my hotel <laughs> while my wife was sleeping. And I'm sitting there trying to talk to a, a friend of mine on Skype and, and I can hear my wife in bed and I'm like, shh, 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 shh. and I'm listening to the news in my ear and I was happy that, you know, did my, did the trade, closed yeah. it and uh, called it a day. Yeah, it was a good feeling waking up to a flat account, I'm gonna say, definitely good. Um, so if you could maybe talk us through how you got to be where you are today, like uh, the story from when you first found an interest in FX to a point where you're now obviously managing a fair chunk of capital and making a living from it. 2007, I was in stocks and equities. <coughs> I've been in stock and equities since I was 18. I'm now 51 years old. So I was in it for, oof, what is that, 15? I can't even figure that out. A long time. A long time. I'm still tired, <laughs> lack of sleep. Um, I traded stock and equity. I was in the venture capital business. Uh, I raised a lot of money for companies. In 2007, the market started looking for, you know, top heavy, problems were happening in the world and I realized it was time to get out of that business. But trading being a passion, a friend of mine introduced me to currency trading saying that this type of trading is recession proof, which it's actually it is. Because currencies trade all the time. It's not like going along a stock and the economy takes a beating, you're stuck in a stock, you may be stuck in it for three years but while you're waiting for the economy to turn around. With currency trading, you're just trading volatility trading news, so I, I actually want the more chaos in the world, the more opportunity there is. Yeah. You got, you know, lots of things that are going on in the world, lots of changes with different economies, and that's all positive for currency trading. So being a recession-proof business, it intrigued me, and that's how I learned about it, but I also went through a bit of a journey learning about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what were some of the pitfalls that you experienced on that journey? That's some of the pitfalls I experienced in that journey was uh, first, when I got into currency trading, I got introduced to it by a friend who ran a fund. He was into automated systems. And for me, it just, I went down that journey. I went the journey of EAs. EAs. Uh, even though <laughs> I knew how to mainly trade stocks, it was new currency side was completely different for me, different asset class. So, you know, I went through a period of a year trying to figure out if automated systems work. And what I did find out after, you know, investing a lot of money <laughs> and losing a lot of money like a lot of people in, the, in this business is that for that they just didn't work for me that I, the only thing that would work for me is learning how to trade properly and using my brain yep okay 
Great. And what gives you an edge on the market? Like, why do you think that you can beat the market long term? Uh, because I think that I have the mindset and the brain that will keep up in any market conditions and evolve and the market doesn't bother me. I don't get, it's emotionless to me. I don't get rattled by the market. To me, it's just going to my desk, do my job, leave my job, go for a run, and I'm happy. Yep. So that mindset that I never veer from is what's gonna keep me going in this business to the day that I decided. Would decide you say your dedication to it? Because I know that oh, it's my life. spending three days with you earlier, you live, breathe, and eat Forex. It's my life. I, leave, I live, breathe, and Forex is other than my wife, and my kids, and my family, Forex is the most important thing to me other than them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's wife, kids, family, Forex. <laughs> um, and for those that don't know, I'm wondering if you can briefly explain your strategy and why you use different lot sizing at different points in time and why you don't let trades run. The guy asked me earlier today, yeah. you know, why not let a trade run for 200 pips? Because often your direction in the market is it's normally correct. Correct. The pair runs a long way, but you end up pulling out for 10 pips. Okay. First of all, because I'm a scalper, I'll give you an example. Say the market in a day moves 100 pips. For me to catch that move, I'd have to be at the top to the bottom make 100 pips. Versus me doing 10, 10 pip scalps in that day I catch the same top to the bottom of the market without having to catch exactly the top and actually the bottom. So my chances of making more money scalping and getting, no one ever catches the top and the bottom, that's impossible. So yes, 99% of my trades run into more profit, but I'm on to my next trade. I'm looking for a new setup, I'm flat. I don't have the risk anymore of the market because as you know, the market's always changing. So I could be in a trade that looks like it's gonna go in more profit Something can come on the news wire that could change that. So I, my mindset is like get in, get out, and look for a new trade. Yeah, right. And why do you use different lot sizing? I use a different lot size for risk control. Um, when I trade, the most important part of trading is managing risk. You know, I'm trading low leverage. So if I ever get into a trade that I feel goes the wrong way against me at a certain time, I know that I have a lot of room to still manage my risk, keep my accounts safe, and at the same time, get out of that trade profitable or, or break even. But th during that period, because I'm using low leverage and I'm managing risk properly, I'm going to survive tomorrow. Why most people fail in Forex is because they over leverage their accounts. Um, I want to get back to where you started and how you became the trader that you are today. Because obviously spending a few days with you earlier, you have a close relationship with your mentor who you speak with five hours a day. Correct. Um, you guys are like trading partners, you're constantly bouncing each other. How much of that do you attribute to your success now? Like if you didn't have him, would you be here today? No. No, I had the right mindset. But this guy had 35 years of experience of trading for one of the largest funds, I won't mention this in this video, in the US, one of the most successful funds out of New York. And his, we met and he realized that I had the right mindset and he took me on as a partner slash um, protege and gave me the tools <laughs> that I need today to be a successful trader. And that partnership with me and my mentor exists and, and will continue because we have common interests together. We, manage, we do manage money together. So we talk, you know, trading is very lonely. Sitting trading in front of a screen for eight to 10 hours a day, listening to a news wire, a news feed listening to CNBC, listening to my, uh, my other uh, live news feeds. It gets lonely. So it's nice to have somebody that you can trade with, talk to, bounce ideas off of. I mean, it, it's the same even for him because he's been trading 35 years, but he enjoys our, our, our friendship and how we can talk about trades, talk about trade setups. Many times I don't take the same trades as him, but you know, we do have the same style of trading and I attribute my success to him. I've noticed that. Now we both know you don't accept a loss very often, hmm. but there's gonna be a point in time, and we all know it, where you're gonna be wrong on the direction of the Euro dollar or whatever. Right. You're gonna be wrong significantly. How are you gonna get out of that? Okay, well, first of all, it's been three years. Three years. Uh, 
there's been no trade over a period of time that's actually been wrong. If you know, even that when I went into my 13% drawdown over the CAD, no, no, it ended up that the CAD went, I think it, it was, I gotta think it back then, 107, I think, or 108. Well, I the the, the CAD ended up going up. Raising my heart. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But in the end of the day, my direction was right because I look at it long term. I look at the euro right now for the next year, year and a half when I'm trading. If you notice, I'm trading short the euro right now. There's a reason. I used to trade long and short. I don't trade short long anymore because I know the market, the euro is going to be under pressure. The US will be raising interest rates in the next six months, say. So as they raise, then Europe is still not raising. They're, they're going through a period of quantitative easing, which is stimulus, which was what the US went through three years ago. So they're still three years behind. So just based on inf interest rate differential, the euro is going to be weak for the next couple of years. Yes, there's going to be a time where I'm going to go long again. So if I'm going to trade and it goes against me, I strategically place those trades. If you notice, I'll give you this example. My last euro trade, which had bounced off of, which you saw live when, when uh, President Draghi was speaking. At that point in time, it bounced off it by one pip, and I could have cl closed that trade and been flat. But you know, and I don't know, at that time, the market looks like it was going to fly through that trade and keep going. Why? Because where I put that trade, that was support. So, sorry, that was resistance. So what happened was, I got in that trade where, where it was resistance. <coughs> it turned it So the market, when it kept coming down to that level, it quickly reversed because the market used as an excuse based on something that Draghi said that day to reverse at that price because that's where all the bids were. So I knew that's where all the market was looking to buy. So I knew it would eventually come down to that level again. But those areas are so critical that even today, a non-farm payroll, it came down there. It kissed my entry price. It reversed 20, 30 pips. Then it came obviously down there. And then when it came through there, it went through and down there through a vengeance. I was half asleep at that time. I was not watching the charts, but I looked back and looked at them. And I saw it went down to like uh, 20 or 30 pips lower because that area had so much support. So on areas that I'm wrong, they usually come back. It's sort of like, sort of like the, the, it's an elastic band where it goes one way and has to come back another way because currencies just can't keep going. So usually those areas come back. If I am wrong where it's not going to come back all the way and I get to that point, my, my trick is you add strategically a second trade and you look to go back halfway between the two. But lately I haven't had to do that because I always felt that the band, that, the elastic that stretches and goes to one side will come back eventually to the middle which is where I was. It may not go below it, which sometimes it does. Once it hits it, it goes through it. But so I've never had, I haven't had in a long time to use that strategy. But when I'm wrong and I know I'm wrong, I'm gonna add a second trade. And I know that where I add that second trade, it's gonna go back to the middle. So I know for sure I'm gonna see that middle point. That's gonna be the middle of the elastic band. There's a new middle, it's gonna raise higher. Okay, because last year and the year before, if you got into a drawdown, the way that you would get out of it would be to hedge. Like the, the Canadian dollar trade that we're talking about, Correct. you were actually wrong on the original entry. You Correct. ended up hedging it and flipping it around and going long. So that's kind of... Yes. That's is, a trick. Is that, is that that's a, that, No, that no. No, that's, future, that's a, still a tool in my toolbox, but I haven't had to use it. And I, that is a tool that I'll use on extreme measures when I don't want the accounts to get into a big drawdown and I need to manage the risk. But I haven't had to use that tool since the CAD. Yep. Okay. And what personal traits do you consider essential for a professional forex trader? Personal traits. Yeah, what, do, what does it take? Like, um, I'm trying to think of an example. You know, do they need to be unemotional? You said before, do they, they need to be... 100% emotionless. Because emotion is what kills most traders. Yep. That's the first thing that kills. And the second thing, they need to know how to manage risk. That's, that's the two important things, then they need to have a, straight, a trading strategy. Yeah. But unless they have no emotions and can't manage risk, I don't care how good their strategy is, they're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna fail. Okay, and if you're so good, why don't you go and work for one of these big hedge funds? No interest. Why not? Because I've worked outside of an office for 30 years of my life, and I've made a ton of money doing so, and I enjoy the quality of life that I have, where I love working from home, I love the ability to be able to do my, finish my day and then go for a jog or do what I want. If I have to go to an office, my whole routine is, is gone and I really enjoy my routine. I enjoy that quality of life. I enjoy the, the, the freedom of, of working for myself. I've never worked for anybody else.
So if a bank came on tomorrow and said, he's 50 million bucks. No? Can't do it. Okay. That's good. That's good for us. Can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and what's the appeal about working for retail clients like us as opposed to high net worth individuals or a bank? It's new for me. At first, it became a bit of a challenge at the first you know, a little bit because I had to deal with the emotions of the retail client. But now at this stage, I actually really enjoy it. I, I enjoy making a difference in people's lives. It's just part of my nature. I'm happy to hear that people are making money with me. I don't want to hear of people ever losing. And, you know, it, it disturbs me when I read somebody's blown up their account because they over lever leveraged on their end what they've done. But I really enjoy hearing that other people are benefiting from my trading. And, you know, to me, it's, it's a nice feeling. It's something I enjoy doing. Yeah, okay. And how would your wife and kids describe your attitude towards Forex? Uh, you have to ask them. <laughs> no, I'm asking you from their perspective. I think they would think I'm obsessed. You are obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's saying that. Yeah, I think they would think I'm obsessed with Forex. Yeah. And my kids too. My, they know me. They know that I'm at my computer. It's just the way it goes. Just the way it works. <laughs> yeah. It's bread on the table. Yeah. yeah. But the weekends, my, all my computers get shut down. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not in front of them. Even from here, I logged in and shut them all down. <laughs> just a habit I have. I enjoy it. I enjoy turning them off on the weekends. Yep. Switching off. Relaxing. All right, and one final question. What's the end goal? So we've been doing this for a couple of years now. Getting to a point where people are starting to make good money. We've got a nice client base. Yeah. Where are we going to be, assuming the performance continues? You know, two, I, five years from now. I don't know. I mean, the more the merrier. For, it makes no difference to me in terms of having more clients, more investors, more. Uh, the end goal is, uh, I'm hoping that I can give some positive light into the forks industry that's been so badly uh, tainted over the years with scammers you know, on the internet, people that sell dreams to people that are not realistic. And I'm happy to be one of those 5% that can share the dream with people around the world. So the goal is, I hope it just keeps growing. I'm here to stay. So you're not going to retire. Once you get no. to a certain net worth, let's say you're worth 50 million bucks. No, I enjoy it. I, it, it's, it, even if I, it, I enjoy waking up every day and trading. So you get excited when you come Yeah, to yeah, I love it. Okay, great. So I'd like to open it up to anyone help else here that has any questions. Um, <laughs> no, that's yeah, it. Before we wrap it up. I should have planted some questions in here. <laughs> oh, yeah, Go thanks. <laughs> thanks. In the hot seat. Um, can you share your biggest mistake and what lessons you've learned from it? The biggest mistake I can think of was probably... Um, Yeah, my biggest mistake in my trading before I got into mailing trade would have been myself going through the early parts of the journey and trusting EAs, which was an expensive mistake for me personally. Um, oh, okay. Uh, what oh, you, what, you mean mistake? Your, 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 your oh, your my, <coughs> on my own trading? Yeah. Probably the, uh, looking back in the last three years would have been the CAD trades. Really? That was you. That's my biggest mistake. That's why you don't trade CAD anymore. Uh, well, I'm from Canada. I love the currency. I love the. I know everything about the economy, but I don't trade as often anymore. If I see an opportunity that I feel is really there, I'll trade it. Yeah. Did you have a couple more, Jerry? Oh yes. Um, second one is uh, how do you identify or pick your trading levels? I pick my trading levels using support and resistance. Okay. I don't use. And there's nothing complicated on my charts. Um, I could trade off my iPad with. Out my, you know, setup that I have on my on my uh, trading computer and still trade the same. So it's mainly support and resistance, looking at price action, and and news flow. I'm very up to, uh, when I trade. If I don't have access to news, I can't trade. So that's one of my key uh, aspects of my trading is is trading when with the ability to use the news in my advantage. Uh, just want to add on that. Um, what sort of time frame would you look at the budget? I look at the uh, five minute, 15 minute, one hour, four hour charts. Five minutes, 15 minutes, and four hour. And I look at dailies too. Dailies, 
I have up on every pair that I trade, yeah. I have up, I have per pair two screens. Okay, well, two screens. So I have two levels. Yeah. So the lower levels are five and fifteens. Yeah. The upper levels are one hours and four hours. And I have the dailies behind the four hours. Yeah. So I have five charts per pair that I, that I, every pair I trade. And I always look at those five. I look constantly at four time frames, which is five, 15, one hour and four hour. Constantly, they're in front of my face. So all, all day long, those four charts are always showing in front of my face. For people that are, are looking to follow you, those mum and dads, individuals, what size of camp would you recommend them starting with? Um, something that they're comfortable with. I don't want the, uh, anyone who's starting with me, I, I want them to feel that in their mind, they prepared to lose it because only, no, what I'm saying is I don't want them putting, I don't want them where they have to wake up every day and, and feel pressure. I'd rather them start small, get to know me, get to know my trading style and feel more comfortable. Private clients I take on, I never, I, if they come to me and they say I want to give you one or two million right away, I say no, 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 don't do that. Give me a hundred thousand, let me start out for 30, 60 days so you can get a feel for my trading style and feel comfortable with me. So my advice is to new clients to start with something that you're comfortable with and build your account. So if you start with me, say with 5,000 and your plan is to put 100, let, let me trade for a month, get comfortable, or speak to somebody who, who I've traded for already. See, my private clients, I don't let them speak to other private clients because I don't market myself that way. It's just, there's, there's a confidentiality. I, I don't want, I don't mention their names because if, if you're a client of mine, it's no one else's business. And so w I show them my track record. I talk to them. And then, so I can't give them the, you know, go call this client. I want, you know, I, don't, I just don't market myself that way. That's just, so I use my, myself and my history and, and telling them that start small and, and, let, and let me prove myself to you. So my advice is start with something that you're comfortable with. And then if your plan is to do a lot more after 30 days and you're, you're comfortable watching my trading style, then, then go bigger. And is the best thing to do not to try and help you? Just let you do the trades and watch? And Correct. <laughs> that's, a, oh my God. <laughs> There's a lot of backseat traders and that's not gonna change my style. It's not gonna change anything. That w what I do, whatever they post or try to post thinking that they're giving me advice, I don't listen because I can't change from what I already know. So what's important is just let me do my job and I'll do it right. Um. You mentioned in the forum once that uh, sometimes your levels are voided by um, certain view news events. Correct. What sort of things sort of like void the levels that you've sort of pre-placed there? Uh, like give an example, on a non-farm payroll number. If a non-farm payroll number today, for example, came in weak, certain levels would be avoided for a small period of time because eventually economic news, you go through like phases. It might be a, a month of bad news and all of a sudden the next month things come out great again and the, the whole view on the currency changes. So mostly uh, uh, employment numbers, uh, that's the main thing that can void levels. That's actually, the non-farm payroll is probably the biggest news that does. But I still, as you know, trade through non-farm payroll. A trader can't be scared to trade through news because if every time I have to worry about news and I'm just going to be <coughs> flat and never in a trade and tiptoe around the market, there's always news. So today when I was going in and off on payroll, I purposely try to keep my trades down, the amount of trades. So if you notice, I went in with one <coughs> trade today. I did a few trades prior to non-farm payroll, but I was very careful. I could have traded a lot more actively before non-farm payroll. The reason I didn't is because my plan was I'd, I feel more comfortable going with less trades. So if the trade goes against me, if it gets voided because of the economic news, I have room to still maneuver myself until things turn around because they don't just go one way. They always turn. Yeah. It's just the nature of the market. Because um, it's just I'm leading on from that. Um, back when, back in the first few weeks of May, um, the market was just in the euro was just going nuts. It was just constantly rising day after day after day. And we noticed that you pretty much stayed out <coughs> and stayed flat most of the time. Yes. And uh, what, what caused, what you know, prompted you or what, what sort of experience did you have to, to see? Because I, you know? see, I could see they were taking out stops and I could see the, the force of the way the euro was climbing. So my, I knew that I wasn't going to get suckered into that where I got into a, you know, 
like a lot of traders, where they were ru running stops, and just the price action and the force of the rise was gave me concern. So that alone kept me out of the market. Uh, I mean, adding on to that question, um, I mean, could you explain to us uh, possibly the effects of the German bonds? Well, the German bonds, like yeah, the German bonds this, uh, this week raised. They went over one uh, percent, and that was because of uh, President Draghi some comments he made, but. They need to keep the rates down in Europe. I mean, the, the whole part of QE is lower rates, stimulus. And so if the, if the German rates start rising too much, the central bankers of Europe are going to start talking it down because they can't let the bonds go up like, or, or there's going to be an issue because the euro is going to appreciate. They want a low euro because that's going to spur exports. They need that. that I mean, when, when central governments are doing QE, their goal is to spur the economy. With, with low interest rates and a weaker currency. So if that gets, if it goes against them, you'll notice they'll start chatting it down. They'll start, you know, their central bankers will come on the wire and make a comment, and that'll change the whole dynamics. So yes, the G German bonds in the last, after Draghi spoke, hit, I think, 1% uh, yesterday or today. But, you know, that's gonna be short-lived. Um, plus, obviously, you guys know, there's also a Greek situation right now. That also causes a bit of rise too because the Greek yields are going up. So the other uh, yields in Europe, will, they won't go up like the Greek yields, but they will cause a little bit of increase in yields. So being, you know, and I've mentioned in the last few weeks in the forum that my lot side is being reduced because of the, German, the Greek overhang. We still don't have a resolution. I actually thought it was gonna get resolved on Friday and so did the market. But right now Greek made a deal with the IMF to defer their June payments in one lump sum. Yeah. So they got, you know, they got off Friday from not having to make that small payment, but they got a lot more payments due this month. And there's actually some treasury, I think there's some uh, T-bill redemptions too, not just the IMF. So there's a lot of stuff that they have to pay this month of, ju uh, of June. So my, my view is they're actually gonna come to a deal. I think they're just playing a game. They're, they're, they're forcing the, the EU and the rest of the creditors to do a deal that gives them a little more breathing room. And they're doing it by sort of making them fear that they're gonna default. So it's a game of uh, cat and mouse. At the end of the day, I would be shocked if they don't make a deal. And I think it's gonna be something that's always, it's gonna be an 11th hour deal. But I am gonna keep my lot size down because I need, my goal as the trader is to always manage risk. So as you know, I went from on my master 0.6 lots to one lot last week, and I was planning on going to 1.6 lots to next week, but that was based on a Greek resolution. I'm gonna stay at one lot. I may go a little higher, but I'm not, and I'm not going back to 0.6s, but I'll probably stay around one lot. But as everyone knows, the one lot, I can still make decent returns. If you look at my first week of the month, it's, it's definitely beating last month by a lot. So I can make enough trades in the, in the month at one lot to still, still make a good return and at the same time, keep a risk down on our accounts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like questions. <laughs> no problem. We can talk all night. <laughs> okay, we will, no problem. Um, me, me and Max are actually part of a small group of traders. There's yes. four of us in the group. Um, we follow your trades like every night. There's nights <laughs> where like, both, all four of us will sit there, we'll chat, we'll watch your trades like on Skype, we, we, we just sit there, like in Australia, it's, it's <laughs> you know, like midnight to like three or four a.m. We just sit, sit in front of the screen, watch the trades, watch you trade, it's, it's insane. We, we love it. It's <laughs> um, good, I'm glad to hear that. So what are your top tips for becoming a successful trader? Like what, what website, you mentioned, what, what sort of news, what news sources do you use? I use Ransquark. Yeah, we got Ransquark. We got, got Ransquark, <laughs> everything you said. Do you have Ransquark? Yeah, we got Ransquark. Yeah, Ransquark's very good. Um, I use Twitter. Twitter? No, I use Twitter. Really? Okay. I follow uh, a few people on Twitter. I, I follow uh, Zero Hedge, which is an institutional uh, feed for institutional traders. I follow, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a service called Live Squawk, which is a competitor of Ransquawk, but it's not as good. I follow their Twitter feed because sometimes they put things out that doesn't come on, on Live Squawk. Yep. And uh, that would be my my advice in terms of the news, uh, Twitter and uh, Ransquawk. That's the only two main stuff that you use? I also have a service where I get uh, um, Dow, uh, Dow Jones. Dow Jones, okay. yep. 
Um, how about like sort of uh, like other resources and books and websites and other things? That I, can, I I actually sort of enhance. Um, anything that I've, in my opinion that I've found on the web, trading coaches are scammers. Because if they're such a good tra trader, why are they coaching to make a living? Like, think about it. Why are they selling their services for one ninety nine? People will say, why are you selling your trading for? Because I'm making money from it. Because I'm making performance. No, no, but I'm making my trading makes me a performance, makes me a living. So I get, I benefit from the, from, I get, I re, I benefit from the, from my trading financially. These guys who are selling uh, mentoring or coaching. They're not trading, they're just selling coaching and they're doing webinars and they're, they're trying to sell the people the dream of Forex. But if they're so good, they can make a lot more doing what I'm doing, which is managing money, than, than their little coaching thing. So, I mean, I'm sure there are legit ones, but they're hard to come by. Um, there is a good book and it's in both motions. What's it called? Um, trading in the Zone. Yes, Trading in the Zone is a good book. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, 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 that's a good book. Yeah, we're good. Thank you very much. No Thank problem. So much, yeah. any, right. any more questions? Any more questions? No. No, no more oh, questions. Well, just say thank you heaps for today and giving us the information. Thank you everyone for coming. People from all over the world, from Australia, Canada, um, South America, Asia. It's um, it's very humbling to have so many people here. Uh, got my team here as well. My business partner Will, who is the guy that built Simple Trader. So it's, it's quite a remarkable piece of software and we would not be here today without uh, his ability to code that, so I definitely want to acknowledge that. Um, so it's equal parts, your ability to trade, your ability to build a system that can distribute those trades, because without the ability to distribute them, we wouldn't have a business. 100%. Uh, and then you guys for supporting us, so thank you and really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to relax, we've got plenty of drinks, there's some hot food coming as well, about 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, that's here, is it? Thanks okay, so that's out there. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I'm off the hot seat. Yeah.